War. War never changes. That's a terrible tagline. Well, not a terrible tagline, but it takes a rather narrow view of history. It's common to see world history as a series of wars because they're big, dramatic events with easy beginnings, middles, and ends, and so it's easy to craft a narrative around them, especially when you decide to set that narrative in a time and place still being ravaged by a 200-year-old war that continues to shape the ecological and anthropological landscape of an entire continent, and it's implied the entire world. A world still suffering from, well, a fallout. Now, in the Fallout franchise, created by Interplay Entertainment and currently published by Bethesda Softworks, combat has always been a central mechanic of each game, and conflict between factions and armies has always been present. But just as important is the role played by the environment. How so many quests involve finding resources, managing the landscape, securing energy, making the land just a little bit more fertile. Even if that means getting your guns loaded and clearing out a vault full of glowing radioactive living- Oh shit. Now, the aesthetic of Fallout is borrowed from pop imagery of the Cold War, a conflict which is often framed as purely ideological. But the nuclear holocaust in Fallout's alternate timeline had very material causes. The spoils of war were also its weapons. Petroleum and uranium. For these resources, China would invade Alaska. The U.S. would annex Canada, and the European Commonwealth would dissolve into quarreling, bickering nation-states bent on controlling the last remaining resources on Earth. Like Ron Perlman said, it was a war driven by resources. Like all wars, actually. Well, sure, they market their wars as something other than that. Blood has been spilled in the name of everything, from God, to justice, to simple psychotic rage. But the root is often the same. Someone needed land, or food, or water, or fuel, and someone else had it. Sometimes those needs can't be met, and the culture dies. In his book, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, biologist Jared Diamond laid out a five-point framework of contributing factors to a civilization's collapse. Environmental damage, climate change, hostile neighbors, a lack of viable trade partners, and the society's responses to all of the above. The United States, as it existed in Fallout, had a lack of viable trading partners due to oil shortages around the world, and its choice to hoard the remaining supplies caused a global neighbor, China, to become hostile. The U.S. response was to launch the entire nuclear arsenal, causing global climate change and irreparable environmental damage. So, the bombs fell. That's a given. But what isn't given is the fate of the survivors. Whether each village you wander through, from Shady Sands to Megaton, will survive for another generation. Yes, the problems they face can be... bizarre. Great packs of rad scorpions are killing our herds. But societies have fallen for much simpler reasons. Reasons far less dramatic than a nuclear holocaust. Easter Island's Polynesian culture collapsed because of massive deforestation. The natives killed trees that, while great for canoes and moving large stone heads, were also necessary for preventing erosion and keeping the soil fertile and stable. The Maya collapsed because of the Yucatan Peninsula's shaky relationship with water. Rain is highly seasonal there, wells are near impossible thanks to the area's geology, and despite projects like massive canals and reservoirs, Mayan leaders were unable to supply fresh water to the masses after one too many droughts. Or take a modern collapse, like the one that happened in Rwanda in 1994. Common knowledge attributes that atrocity to blind ethnic hatred, but even it was exacerbated by the fact that most in Rwanda were starving. In a culture traditionally built on local subsistence farming, the population had outpaced the amount of available arable soil to properly feed them, a powerful incentive for killing a neighbor and taking their food and land. Of course, there are many theories and counter-theories about the causes of those specific collapses, sensitive ones at that, but a common thread in all of them is simple need. Need for food, need for water, need for life. That far more than war, never changes. Consider a biome like the Capital Wasteland. 
fragile, definitely, but it still manages to sustain a small population of about 2,000 or so named characters, plus an uncountable number of nameless NPCs, plus multiple large species that suggest enough biodiversity to support a population of multiple large predators. All this despite every source of water being irradiated and seemingly no fertile topsoil, having been blown away by the nuclear blast that turned the White House into a crater. Sure, every human settlement seems to have at least one Brahmin, but what can they possibly graze on? This? I can say as a DC native that there's never been a city tradition of farming, so maybe, like today, the area is sustained entirely by trade with more prosperous neighbors. But the pit doesn't look that fertile, and as of writing this I have no clue how much agriculture you can find in the Commonwealth. But let's just assume that the Capital Wasteland is barely sustainable. Now, consider the Mire Lurk. They are angry, but also tasty. My boys are hunting lurks. Finest meat you could get. Grandma Sparkle's right. In the game, eating Mire Lurk meat gets you 20 hit points, while most other food only gets you 5. If the capital wanted to grow, you could imagine them growing fat off this nutritious yet untamed animal as a staple of the wasteland diet. Now in Fallout lore, mire lurks are descended from modern Chesapeake Bay horseshoe crabs. In reality, these crabs feed on algae when they're young, before moving up to a diet of worms and other small seabed dwelling animals. It's possible that mire lurks have a similar diet. They don't eat humans. They supposedly only attack you in-game because they're very territorial. And while the Potomac River makes your Geiger counter go berserk, it's possible that some river life was sturdy enough to adapt to radioactive waters. Enough to support human-sized fauna like the Mire Lurks. Now, if humans were to adapt the environment with a massive project like, say, turning the river from rad water to fresh water, would that life survive the transition? And if they didn't survive, would the food chain break? And would the capital wasteland lose a keystone species? Obviously this is fan speculation and not really based on anything in the world of the game, but in reality, societies can and have collapsed due to unexpected effects of human activity, regardless of how beneficial it may have seemed at the time. Not that the game is realistic in any way. I mean, we're supposed to believe that 200 years is both long enough for scorpions to evolve into the size of sheep, and short enough to still have unscavenged instant macaroni and cheese. Also, ghouls are bullshit. You'd think you'd never seen a ghoul up close before. Did you know that radiation is magic? You know what? I think I'm turning into a ghoul! You should be turning into a corpse! But of course, Fallout isn't based on science. It's based on a rich tradition of post-apocalyptic science fiction. There's H.G. Wells' The Shape of Things to Come, which describes the course of a world ravaged by a war fueled by a terrible new technology. There's Ray Bradbury's There Will Come Soft Rains, about a form of automated technology that would outlast humanity. There's Walter M. Miller Jr.'s A Canticle for Leibowitz, in which an order of monks based in the American Southwest preserve civilization by treating pre-war technology like sacred artifacts. Not unlike the Brotherhood of Steel, there's Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, which ends with a nuclear apocalypse where a government organization preserves its population in a series of underground vaults. Dwelling space for several hundred thousand of our people could easily be provided. And of course there's that deliciously ironic soundtrack. We'll meet again. Don't know where. Those vaults may have influenced a similar underground program in Harlan Ellison's A Boy and His Dog, which features a society modeling itself on an absurd facsimile of 1950s America, and its star was a lone scavenger who wandered the waste with his dog companion, which was a big influence on George Miller's Mad Max films about another lone wanderer, albeit one who chose to help various survivors of a far different wasteland. And of course, the whole thing is saturated with this snide take on the naivete of atomic age 1950s America. Reserve your family spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault today. A snide take, but not an inaccurate one. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? However, there's one part of 1950s Americana that the Fallout series plays relatively straight. To the town of our free road, a stranger one fine day. The Western. 
New Vegas shows its influence most clearly, but the Western has had its influence on the Fallout series from the very first game. Most of the main plot points follow the structure of classic Westerns closely. A stranger arrives in an unknown society. A stranger who's strong, or quick on the draw, or silver-tongued. Someone who's special in some way. The town warily recognizes a difference between themselves and the stranger. Though they may not fully accept the stranger, they give him a special status. The town is beset by villains, villains who are stronger than society. Society is endangered until the stranger fights and defeats the villains. The stranger loses their special status and fully integrates into society. That's Fallout in a nutshell. A democratic power struggle between the individual and the community. A black hat, a white hat, and a town that ain't big enough for both of them. Of course, as with all games, the interest lies in the choice you have. Maybe the town deserves the black hat. Maybe it belongs to no one at all. You're a stranger who rides into town. You meet the local sheriff. I don't know why, but I like you, boy. But the choice as to whether that town lives or dies... You could assist us in erasing this little accident off the map. That choice is yours. Take away the combat, and Fallout can be seen as a game of relationships. The relationship between individual and society, between society and the state, between the state and the environment, between the environment and the individual. It foregrounds the impact of an individual's choice on the region, because those individual choices add up. Remember, Jared Diamond's fifth factor in a collapse was humanity's response to hardship. Survival is not hardship. It's a decision. Yes, Fallout has hundreds of sad stories lying in its ruins. Senseless violence, lasting scars, the ghosts of happier times. But I think at its heart, beyond the brown ruins and black humor, the Fallout series is inherently optimistic. Despite experiencing the worst possible tragedy, there is still life on Earth. And we have the agency to keep life going, no matter how strange life may become. Because even if war never changes, for worse or for better, we do. So wish on the moon, and someday it may be tomorrow, you will suddenly